So I'll be happy to hear your story. If you have two minutes to share, just tell me your background prior to Sandler. How did you get started, Jeff? So I always had, you know, the majority of my career, other than a little um, sideways after I went to business school, I was a bond trader on Wall Street for a while. That's awesome. Which is, I mean, again, a lot of aspects of sales. And if I knew Sandler back then, I'm sure I could have done a more effective job. But, you know, VP of sales throughout my career, managed a big team and uh, was in the consumer products business. So I used to manage a team as well as have direct account responsibility, like for all like the big mass purchase, like Target, Costco, Walmart, Walgreens, CVS. So I used to call in all the big mass merchants and you know that was the sale that I was really kind of brought up with and simple in some ways but difficult in others you know and it was it was funny because we never really needed the prospect we had a pretty good brand name so if you if you called the Walmart buyer they'd want to see you you know and you, you'd feel all proud of like you know hey I got an ap appointment with the Walmart buyer or the Target buyer and prior to Sandler <laughs> it sounds so naive but little did I know that well, if, you know, as much as I thought that I had a good relationship and they liked me, as much as it was that, you know, they knew I had good information and knowledge about the industry and the market. Right. And so the big thing was not getting sucked for unpaid consulting and wasting time and shipping samples and in these long sales cycles and never had a framework on what the heck was really going on. Just doing whatever they asked you. More or less. And, and no, no, not bad. I was, I was successful. You know, I was, it was fairly likable and I'd be curious. So I'd ask questions, but I tell you the big thing, Solomon, you know, my, my big takeaway, cause then you look back, I was pretty good, but I could never get other people on the team to do what I did. Got it. That's amazing. There was no common language, right? It was like, Hey, you should be doing this and you should be trying that. And couldn't replicate the skills and you know i really learned like and you know coming to sandler it's like oh my goodness like I, I i always say my prayers it's like i can't believe i made so much money for knowing so little in the world <laughs> many times too it's the same kind of thing that we were having difficulties getting multiple people to perform the same way uh, right. Is it what, what, you know, is a pre-sale planning and you know, a pre-call planning like are you doing that or are you saying something different do you how do you do it? And we're a marketing agency, so we're selling marketing services. And yes, right. there's a knowledge gap, but once you get the knowledge gap, the rest is his techniques. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's great. Yeah. I remember we'd, we'd hand over, yeah, we did a pre-call plan. We would develop an agenda, slide it across the table to the prospect. They would take it, slide it back and say, here's what I need today. <laughs> wow. It's, it's, I'm just glad. I'm I'm just glad if I could re recall all my business cards and say that is not the Joe Ippolito that you I, knew back back then that it's today because it's almost embarrassing. I know. How long ago did you start training? So it's like I'm in my 15th year, 16th year. Wow, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, so then you come into the Sandler world and you know prospecting. You know, I mean, that's I never had to really prospect because people would you know. Call want to see it right right now you know it was a different world and engaging so that whole prospecting piece was you know like that's the, the death of you know for anybody and realizing wow there's actually a methodology that can make this a no pressure call right and it's not necessarily the tactics or techniques i don't know if you know you probably see the same thing it's really just develop that mindset and concept of having a conversation and see if you're a fit Right. That, that takes all the pressure off that allows you to have that conversation. Right. Simply letting, not, not try to sell in that prospecting process. Simply find out, do we even want to have a conversation? Is there any, yeah. Is I mean, you know, to use Sandler terminology, is there any problem, issue, pains, challenges, goals that you possibly have that I might be able to possibly help you with? And if there are, let's talk again. If there isn't, it's no harm, no foul. Right. Love it. It's really the my you hit it on the head though. It's really, you know, I think from my experience, it's um it's developing the mindset around the whole process. And I think that's where the rules are really important. And I'm gonna be guilty of saying, you know, after you called and said, Hey, you listen to the podcast and the rules, and I'm like, you know, I need to dig into the rules more specifically with my clients again. I think every week, right, as you're going through it, 
re kind of talking about the rules over and over, I think it goes into, especially for me, I remember rules more than I remember one little detail, like a bullet point. Exactly. Like rule number, whatever it is, you know, and, yeah. and it, it allows me to educate my team because it's just a rule, just follow the rule. Um, so I guess for me, it just resonated well <laughs> with yeah. the idea. Yeah. Uh, not that the other information isn't just as easy. It's just that it just makes it easy. And there's so many rules, so it's hard to keep up. Yeah. And that's what guides the whole approach. Yes. Yes. So what is your favorite rule? Um, you probably heard them all, right? So hopefully sure. I'm not repeating one. I gave some thought. I mean, I had my rule that kind of jumped up to me, up, you know, top of mind. And I said, I love them all. Sure. And I said, I'm going to get the rules book and, and read through them, see if I've maybe changed my mind or is something else they want to bring up. And I, I think I'm going to stick with the the same one that I've always loved a lot. And I think it has a lot of kind of uh, underlying meaning and why I enjoy it. And, and my rule is when your foot hurts, you're probably standing on your own toe. Wow. Has anybody come up right. with that one yet? Nope. It's the Good. First time. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And I think it's, it kind of goes to what we were talking about, you know, without like, if you don't have a system, and I always like to think of Sandler as an MRI, right, into sure. a sales call and giving you insight on, you know, what you can best prepare for and what you best try to apply. If you don't have that, you know, you come out of a call, you know, you always start thinking for some reason, if it didn't go as well as you wanted, or you didn't get the deal, or the prospect went dark, or whatever they did to you, it's like, well, they just didn't understand what I had to say. Hmm. Or, you know, they had a better relationship with someone else, or they just don't get it, right? Or they're just looking for price. And I think it was the natural, I think if you, you know, if any salesperson was candid, they'd always look externally to why someone didn't do something. And then going through Sandler was like, well, wait a second. What could I have done better to prevent that from happening? Right? Mm -hmm. I didn't have any context to look at it from an MRI to say, well, wait a second. Was I able to set rapport and trust so the person would feel comfortable to ask my answer my questions? Did I try to establish some type of agreements up front so I wasn't endlessly chasing. Right. Did I ask the right questions to get the person engaged to say, hey, you know what, Joe, we should talk again, right? Did I discuss budget up front to get a framework around, hey, is this within the proper range for what the person's thinking about or looking at or competition-wise? Did I ask, you know, other than the person I'm dealing with, did I ask about what their decision process would be and who else is going to poke their nose and, and want to take a look at things. Right. Right. And, and I really started realizing, man, it's like, you know, not only can't you go through sales without looking at yourself to see what you can do better. Then it's like, if you really want to get into the sandless stuff, you can't go through life doing that either. <laughs> it's very true. And, and I'm glad that one rule kind of is like encompasses all of the other rules. Asking those questions and knowing when to shut up. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think, well, you know, that's a good point too, Solomon. I think that's why I like it. It's, um, it's pretty all encompassing right. as far as self reflection. I think, like, too, like, I think when we do our boot camps and everything and we do the common challenges, you know, you typically see for folks that are in a, you know, maybe selling into larger accounts, like, yes, yeah, even some smaller opportunities, many suffer from long sales cycles. Oh, we're just, you know, the industry, we're just, a, you know, a super long sales cycle and it's just the way they work and they resign themselves to say, that's the way it is. And my context around it was, look, you know, I can have all the Sandler skills in the world, you know, Walmart, Target, those guys worked on a sales cycle for when they needed to evaluate, bring goods in and then get into the store. So it was like a nine month sales cycle. So I was kind of stuck in that. But what I didn't realize is that you can get decisions sooner rather than later if you ask the right questions. And outside of a company's natural sales cycle, what are the things a salesperson doesn't do to make it longer than it should be? Sure. 
And I'll always ask that question in a boot camp because they say, oh, long sales cycle, you suffer from long sales cycle. So, you, you know, what are some of the things that you don't do that you think can contribute to that? And, you know, we put them in their groups and they start, the next thing you know, it starts coming up. Well, you know, I probably didn't get any next steps for, for clear agreements. Maybe I didn't ask the right questions. It's true. Maybe I'm not talking to the right people. <laughs> Or you don't have to ship the samples. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to ship the sample. <laughs> right? And it was like, you know, like like anything. And that's what I think Solomon, you know, um, with Sandler, it, it, yes, it is sales, but it's life. And kind of, I cheated a little bit because there's another favorite rule that I have, but it, it ties into this. And I think you kind of alluded to it. My other favorite rule are, is that there are no bad prospects, prospects. Yes. only bad sales people it's a really good one i being around sales reps right they're always just it's the prospect man it's a horrible prospect that person no good no good no good but i'm like really good you know <laughs> <laughs> look at me i'm just like look at me right, right. it's the good same loser yeah, right yeah. and just it's like well where's the deal like what happened yeah and then you see the external excuses well, you know, they're, they're tied up with XYZ Corp. They're loyal to this person. Our pricing was too high. Right. They, they don't understand, you know, it, it, it becomes that external excuse, which again, you know, taking it back to life, making external excuses with anybody is just, you know, look, you have to look at your, I mean, what, what's the saying? You, you have, if you want to change, change yourself first. Right. And, and you know, look, you, me, any salesperson has had that prospect from hell. I mean, it, it, they, they exist, but the mindset and the concept is always, it's on us to try to turn that, change that, modify that, address that as best as we possibly can, knowing that in our world, not everyone's going to buy from us. Good point. Not everybody's a You're good a Chicago day. guy, right? That's right. I'm a Boston guy. Do you like thin pizza or thick pizza? Thin pizza. You like thin? I do. I do too. Carb conscious. <laughs> Carb con We well, you'd find in Chicago, right? Maybe some people, not everyone's going to like thin. They might like pizza, but not all thin pizza. Some people right. are going to like thick pizza. Right. Some people like it with pepperoni. Some people like it with mushrooms. So, so, you know, you can't, I think when you go with that mindset that you should be selling everybody too, and you don't have a mindset of finding fit, that causes a lot of problems. Right. You end up selling to the wrong person and then they would be unhappy because it's probably not a good fit to begin with. But that's a, that's a great point. I know you, you've been training for so many years, Joe. What are some common mistakes that people make outside of stretching sales longer than it should be? Any other common mistakes that you come across that people should just avoid? I'm sure there's a million of them. What comes to mind? There's a really, yeah, I mean, you know, so I think having that system hmm. for sale, I, I'd rather call Sandler, you know, I know there's some like talk between a system and a methodology. I always refer to a system as the step-by-step -step what you'd be doing as a company in your sales process. Sure. Like, you know, it's a discovery call, it's a demonstrate, it's a demo, it's a close. So it'd be a three-step process or system. Then I look at Sandler as a methodology to drive that system. So whether it's a three-step process, an eight-step pro, whatever it is, a, a one-month sales cycle, a one-year sales cycle, Sandler is the methodology to drive that to make each of those steps maximized. And without that, the, the problems are just going to be endless and you can't identify them. It's like, I mean, this goes back to another Sandler rule. Um, the problem the prospect brings you is never the real problem. That's right. It's up to us to figure out what the real problem is. I mean, Solomon, if you came to me and I was your sales guy and I said, uh, hey, Joe, why didn't they buy from us? And I said, well, you know, the guy is loyal to XYZ and they're just not going to switch, right? That's not the problem, Solomon. The problem is, did I ask the right questions? Did I differentiate effectively against the current solution? And every other question, was I talking to the right person? So unless I have that framework, I'm, I'm lost. I mean, I'm, I'm, 
literally law. I, I always like equate it to a football team. They all have a playbook. Right. Right. And Absolutely. again, they pre-plan, you know, their first dozen plays and entire game plan. And then they go try to execute. Imagine if they didn't have a playbook and you get the top professionals in the world that what they in their positions, there's what maybe 50 people as good as them in the entire universe. But you don't have a playbook to assess. Everyone go, goes out and does their own thing. And now you don't have a playbook to assess against, hey, what could we do better? And now the coach on Monday is trying to help them. Impossible. Correct. Impossible. You can't do it. And that's why the sales problems we see are all over the board and they're continuous. The unfortunate thing, the salesperson doesn't even know that it's an issue because they don't know what they don't know. The manager doesn't know it's an issue because they don't know what they don't know. You have a whole conversation of mutual mystification. Yes. So minimally, you waste a ton of time that's not necessary. So I think that once you get that methodology around whatever process or sales process you run for that business, that just starts bringing the clarity that's going to be helpful to everybody. And that's the magic. That's the magic. And to your point earlier, we just started talking. It doesn't happen overnight. No, it doesn't. And uh, sadly, it's sometimes they want a quick fix. They'll bring you in, Joe, and say, Joe, can you fix this? (laughs) And you're just like, where do I start? Yeah. I mean... (laughs) Well, I always ask how long has the problem been going on, right? Right, and, and if anything, if it's their first experience, it's been if they've been selling for twenty years, it's been a problem for twenty years. So, how do you sure. fix a twenty-year problem? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's Sales guy's been selling three years; he has a three-year problem. <laughs> that's very true. And many times, if the organization come together, understand that there's this significant right? Issue with the way the sales is done, the sales process, what we say to the client, how do we differentiate ourselves? I can't imagine that their sales numbers are going to stay where they are. <laughs> you know, once you, once you attack this problem. Well, because, I, no, sorry, Solomon, go ahead. No, I'm saying it's so true, right? That it's a, you can see measurable results because you're doing everything differently, right? So you're not talking 70% of the time anymore, <laughs> right? The well, moment- yeah, exactly. The moment that they implement a system, you start to listen and everything starts to change. Well, I think, you know, typically the first thing I think, and you've probably experienced this yourself, the first thing you see is you can really assess your team a lot more effectively and yeah. who's going to be the folks that are, can bring it for you and who maybe can't bring it as much as you'd like them to. And I think the first thing it does other than generate specific results is gives you a much better viewpoint of who you have on the team correct, and who fits what you need to do. It's a, it's like, look, I, and I go back to, I hate, I hate using the football analogies, but you know, these teams, they draft players from college, they get them from free agency, they trade, no matter how good you are, you come into a team and you have to, you know, you're evaluating how well do you execute their playbook? It's true. Not what you did at XYZ team. It's here's our playbook. You fit within the system. Can you execute? Very and it's, true. It's, it's, it's the same thing with a sales team. So I think that first viewpoint you get with the system is, okay, who do we have? Who can perform? Who can't? And I'm not saying you get rid of people or whatever. It just gives you clarity as a leader on what you have and maybe changes you have to make. And then you start seeing a performance. Absolutely. Improve maybe 90 days later, but it's going to start to tick up. You know, it's always like a few people out there trying things. They, they start, you know, picking away and seeing how they're, you know, getting more effective, having better conversations. But it's like over time, you know, and again, I'm not saying that people, you know, you don't go from a, an eight and eight team to necessarily being a Super Bowl winner in one year. Sure. Right. right? There's a lot of other pieces that come into play, but without that system, even if you get lucky and win the Super Bowl one year, it's not going to be replicable longer term. And especially for companies that are adding people, trying to scale, trying to grow, they have aggressive goals. It's really the only thing to, to do. Keep everybody on the same page. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the, the real surprising thing is we see how many companies out there that just don't have anything. Amazing. And you can tell, right? I mean, I've, I've been buying stuff long enough to know who is a professional salesperson who's trying to sell me than the one that's just talking the whole time, haven't asked me a good question yet. Just like, I'm yeah. just like, wow. Yeah. 
this guy well, could use some help. I think, you know, any sales team usually has the one, well, everyone has to have a top performer. Right. But then they measure that as like, well, that's the ultimate of success. But again, they don't have a criteria to know what the possibilities are. That's very true. And it's surely not replicable. That guy very rarely can replicate those skills to the rest of the team, even if they are the hotshot, even if they've had all the training, they can't be the coach. They can't put that system in and have other people model what they do, unless they have the, the methodology and the framework and the concepts behind and, and reinforcement, and the ability to practice and, co- and role play. Correct. Right. Right. Any final thoughts, Joe, that you want to help someone who is looking to get better? Where do they start? Well, you, you know what I always say, you know, I'm going to repeat something from David Sandler, right, from 40 years ago. Hey, we, we think we have the best system, we have the best methodology, right? Sure. I guess there's some others out there that are probably pretty good too. pick one and, and stick with it. Right. And you'll be better. I mean, do I think Sandler's the best? Yeah, there are others. Yeah, pick one, stick with it. It's like anything else. It's a uh, we we wrote we recently came out with a new book, Gold Medal Selling. I don't know if you saw it, Solomon. Not yet. They interviewed a bunch of Olympic athletes and things like that. And the biggest difference between an amateur athlete and a professional athlete. Now, granted, there's some you know, DNA in, in their physical ability. But outside of that, and I'm not discounting that, the only difference is, is practice, practice, deliberate, diligent practice between an amateur and a professional. And that, I would think that translates just as, as effectively to professional sales. Pick your system, be diligent, practice, role play, learn it, embrace it, and you'll be yeah. better. It's almost like a religion at the end of the day. You got to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, I'm right. (laughs) You have to. It's like every call. You just got to go through the same exact thing, right? Because they don't know who you are or how you work. So every time it's new to them, but it's the same thing for you. You kind of develop that, you know, like you said, it becomes innate because you're doing it over and over. And I have to go back and like, literally, I have this submarine on my wall. (laughs) I'm like, this is where I am. I still do the same thing. Super and I, I think what, what you said that was really powerful earlier is that you, you, you own those concepts because just like a football team, and I don't know why the, the analogies are coming around football. It's all good. It's all good. You, you got a good plan. You step to the line of scrimmage and maybe the other team's not doing what you expected. You call an audible. So, you know, it's not only owning the process, but owning it well enough to adapt it situationally. So you can be effective in different situations. That's where, to your point, the time, that's where the time comes in. Owning it so you can apply it situationally to the prospect, their company, what different, you know, what, what mood were they in when they came into the meeting? Who are they currently working with? What do they think of you, your company, the market? You're navigating all those variables in every sales call and they're all different. Yeah, so you, you need the playbook, but then you need to adapt the playbook situationally to be most effective. Absolutely. How can somebody find you, Joe? J Ippolito, I-P-P-O-L-I-T-O at Sandler.com. Be happy to reach out to me. Be happy to answer any questions, talk to you. And uh, it's been great uh, being on the show, Solomon. Thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Take care. No worries. 